God's servant, Pastor Jose Boveda. Woo! I love him. God bless you guys. This has been a uh, unique time that we've been all sharing. As you know, for uh, two and a half weeks, I've, you know, me and my family have been under, you know, quarantine. And uh, we might as well just call the time that we're all living in, we might as well call it reset. It's very rare when God takes the whole planet and puts the whole planet every nation through the same process. We are in a very special time. There's times where different nations are shaking up and, you know, shaking and sometimes different parts of the financial market. Sometimes there's a season where God starts cleaning up podiums. I don't know if you've, if you've noticed the seasons, the spiritual seasons, where you see leaders fall. Then that opens up the harvest for new re leaders to arise. The Bible says that there's a time and a season for everything. There's a time to gather. There's a time to, to give. The church must recognize what God is doing in this season. And that about sums up my last two and a half weeks. Jose, you as a pastor, do you really know the will of God. We are going to be focusing on what God wants in Las Vegas. When I was a, an evangelist, and I was an evangelist for years, I ministered in different denominations, uh, different groups. Sometimes the groups didn't even agree with one another, and I'm talking about in a hostile way. You got it? But no matter what congregation I stood before, I would always ask this question, you either loved me or you hated me the first night of the, of the revival. That was it. And the first question was this, is how many of you have won a soul to Jesus in the last seven days? You get where I'm coming from? Then I would go the last month. Then I would go the last two months. And I would go all the way down to a year. And that's what I mean. You either, you know, like the evangelist or you didn't, but that pretty much would determine who would come back to the meeting or not. You got it?
the average Christian and I'm considering myself the average Christian by the way does not have the compassion for what God has the compassion for. This morning is the beginning of the will of God for us for this next year. That we're, well, for this year that we're in. The average Christian spends time, most of their spiritual time is how they're going to become a stronger spiritual person. And we teach that here. But the season that we're in right now is a rare season because God has cho chosen to take every nation, every language, every nationality and introduce them to a crisis. And what is the real crisis? That we need Him more. COVID is a crisis. Um, I was told that, you know, my brother is going to pass away within the next uh, day. Maybe, you know, me and my brother have gone through a lot of stuff together. When I was eight years old and he was four years old, as little children, we know what it is to be in, a, in an interrogation room in a communist country where me and my little brother looked at the walls and we saw the instruments that they used to torture people. So we've gone through some things together. We've been in the waters with a great white shark as he looked at us. He looked at us very closely. And let me tell you something. Those guys think they think when you're in the water with them, you tap into what they're thinking because they're thinking about you. You get it? Me and my little brother risked our lives together where death literally just brushed us by. So many families have been affected. Uh, many of us have been in different situations. Businesses. But this is happening in the whole world. So why would God Almighty decide in this time period that we're living in not to bring something upon a nation or a group but to take the whole world and say hello remember the old Beatles song someone's knocking at the door open up and let him in So what we're going to share today is very different. I want you to listen to these words very carefully. You ready? We better take the Sabbath seriously. Because I want to challenge all of you right now to do a study this week and send me 
the chapter and verses where God has changed his mind about the Sabbath. Notice I'm speaking about a particular day. I'm not talking about every ceremony. And you, know, you know what I'm saying in the Old Testament. There is a reason why. So do a study on your own if you care to about the Sabbath. Old and New Testament. And, and just show me the verses where God has changed his mind about the day of rest. You got it? We're going to be talking a little bit about that in the future, but he became what we need. We become what they need. And please don't give me the standard, you know, because I tried to give it to myself in this last two and a half weeks. Oh, I'm supposed to be like Jesus. Really? Do we know what it means to be like Jesus? Do I know what it means to be like Jesus? Well, what does that mean? I think that we've gotten it mixed up. I want to warn you, God is going to take things away from you that you don't want him to take away from you. And God is going to give you things that you're not going to want in the beginning. Did you understand that? I'm not here to play patty cake with you. You get it? What is happening in this whole planet, not just in Las Vegas, is very serious. God is getting ready to launch, and I want you to say this with me, God is getting ready to launch the answer. See, with God, the problem always comes first. Because you have to realize that there is a problem. I have to realize that there is a problem. But whenever a problem hits my life or anything around me, I've learned that the process has begun. God wants to give an answer for a problem that has been ignored. The essence is this. Why is it that we are not winning souls to Jesus? God's addressing that. Most of our time is spent is how I can develop spiritually. How can I give a correct prophetic word? How can I get up and give a message that will cause the dogs to turn into cats? I don't want to fall. I have a need. You get where I'm coming from? To say to be like Jesus is the right answer, but do we understand what that means? This is what Jesus did. The Bible says that he became that he was rich, but he became what? 
for. He never needed a glass of water, but he brought himself to a level where he needed to drink water just like you. He never knew what it was to have his beard tore off his face, but he came to have his beard torn off his face. The Bible says that he was crucified in weakness. What does that mean? Next week's subject is going to be the fellowship of his suffering. What does that mean? We don't even, I'm telling you, uh, the Holy Spirit, I've been spending some intimate time with the Lord and I had no idea what that meant. That's why sometimes we run from it. Because we, we don't know. Now notice I'm including myself in every word. Notice I'm not preaching at you. But we're going to say something in this sanctuary. In his living room. On the day that... Out of all the days in the week, it's his day like no other. Now I'm going to tell you what's happened with me. I said, God, I know what I'm about to prayer, to pray. I know it's a dangerous prayer to my flesh. But I said, God, whatever you need to do to me, never mind the church. This is you and me, God. I want you to do it. I don't even have any idea what I'm really asking for. That was before the process started, then the process started. Are you willing to pray that prayer today? Let me tell you something right now. You will embrace the sweetest experience with God than you've ever embraced before. Jesus came to relate to us, to be like us. Did you know that? The Bible says, For he did not take upon himself the nature of angels, but he took upon himself the seed of Abraham. Do you know what that means? Humanity. To relate to us, to be like us, to a point that he had to pray the prayer that I just told you I prayed before God about my life. When he was in the garden, he was in a position, he was so close to what we are, that he actually said, Father, if it's possible, let's do it a different way. But nevertheless, do with my life and let's do it, whatever you want. You know that the Bible says that he learned obedience through the things he suffered? You know that Jesus learned obedience? It says he learned obedience through the things he suffered. 
But everything he did, becoming as weak as he did, limiting himself, he did it to save the lost. And that's what we've lost focused on. We've depended on Sunday services when the preacher's preaching to win the lost. This is it. The love of God is going to come to us today in such a powerful way that it's going to protect us from ourselves. From our own will. The first thing that the love of God does with a human being is it protects them from themselves. Years ago, I don't remember what the preacher preached, and this is when I first got saved, but I remember this little black sister getting up in the middle of service, and she was not out of order. And she said, he's been better to me than I've been to myself. I still remember that. I don't remember what the sermon was, but I remember that. Because it came from her core. We know about spiritual gifts. We know about scriptures. We know about this. We know about that. We even know which came first, the chicken or the egg. Spiritually, oh yeah. We can find books on subjects about everything under the sun, especially if it makes money. But I want to share something with you. The lost and dying world doesn't care how much we know. It only cares and it only wants this. It's not how much we know, it's they want to know how much we care. How much we care. God has used us in a great way. Praise God. We still have the lowest crime rates. The lowest, I mean, out of all the area commands. Because of you, the officers, and say praise God. But God loves those people so much. And I'm warning you, don't come to try to set up a special meeting with me or with one of the elders, you know, and so forth. When we have people that have real crises, we don't have time to change your diapers. You go to God and change your own diapers. The same thing, been going through the same thing over years and years. And then we have the experts. They just sit back and watch to try to find out what's wrong. But if you ask that expert, when was the last time you won a soul to Jesus? When was the last time you wept? then this pastor is going to say, shut up and leave me alone so I can go help somebody that really has a crisis. Go buy a book on how to be a spiritual giant. Go get yourself a motivational speaker. Because I'm too busy with people that don't have food. 
little children. Better yet, I might ask you and say, what's your day off? My, my, my day off? Yeah, your precious day off. Because I'm going to give you something to pray about. I remember John coming up to me when he first started coming to church. Stand up, John. And he said, he's asking me questions about Jesus. Now see, I have a life that you see right now in front of you preaching. But I also have a life through the rest of the week. Do you know how I prepare for my sermons? By chasing the will of God and pursuing the will of God and doing it. Then I study the Word. Because if you're a hearer or a reader and not a doer, you're one of them. I'm one of them. And we're going to, the love of God is going to hit us so hard today that we're going to be protected from ourselves. Let me tell you something. Satan is nothing compared to your flesh. Satan doesn't own your will. But I remember John coming up to me and saying, I, I, I'll never forget it when I first met you over at Rosie's. And he gets started. See, the work really started at, at somebody's apartment. It didn't start here. And John looked at me, and, and you know, he doesn't know what this Christian thing, what to do, how to, you know what I'm saying? And he looked at me and he said, how, 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 do you, how do you become like Jesus? How do you know? And he started asking these questions and I said, John, just come and spend some time with me. Remember that? Just come and hang out with me. What's your day off? Do you have time? See, it wasn't time for counseling, which is wonderful to do. So, you want to know what happened the first day? We went to a place right up the road. There was a vulgar waiter there, a smart, you know what? You know, the kind of guy that before you were saved, you would just kind of smiled at him and said, You're one of those. And he came and mocked. Some others had decided to go have lunch with us also. And he made his usual remarks. And uh, you remember that, John? Asking if what we wanted to you know, the drink, you want this, that, you know what I'm saying, just messing with you. But see, he had had an accident and he had a problem with his right ear. Or he had lost almost all of it. The phone rang It was his girlfriend. He started to talk. He says, I can't hear. Oh, I forgot. And he had to switch the phone to the other ear so he could hear. He was finished with his phone call.
were sitting there at the table, and I said, hey, let me pray for your ear. You would have thought that an elephant, and excuse me for putting it like this, had come and put it on him. Cut him off guard, huh? And I grabbed his hand. And I said, in the name of Jesus, ear, I speak to you. Shape yourself to the word of God. And the word of God says, by whose stripes you are healed. Released his hand, looked at him. All of a sudden, the power of God hit him and he fell to his knees right there doing in the middle of lunchtime. He didn't care if he got fired or whatever. He raised his hands like this and he just lost it with Jesus. He was instantly healed by the power of God. His girlfriend happens to be Remember, this was boyfriend and girlfriend. That's what they were. She happens to be the person that is one of my, our main video people. I'm talking about that knows her, you know, their stuff. They do it for a living. Thank you, John. I might ask you to do that. So be careful with me. I've become dangerous. <laughs> oh, what's your day off? Tuesday? Okay. We start at 8. Let's go do this thing. But, 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 and I said, oh, you're not serious then, are you? You see what I'm saying? Jesus came to be like them, like us. That's why the Bible says that we have a high priest, that it's touched with every one of our what? The feeling of our infirmities and our weaknesses and so forth, because he was tried and tempted just like we are. You want to know what's different about Jesus? He knows what you're going through. He's experienced it. Because it became as vulnerable as you. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 9.22. To the weak became I as weak. This is the Apostle Paul. You know what we do? We want to show them how victorious we are. We want to show them how God has blessed us. And then when they see all that glory upon us. They'll come to Jesus. And they'll want what we have. I think we missed it. Uh, let's look at the Apostle Paul's technique. Jesus' technique. Not what we have been programmed with. To the weak became I as weak. That I might gain the weak. I am made all things. I want you to listen to this. Notice how he worded it. I am made all things. You know what I'm made? I am made just. I am made all things. So I can relate to them in all things. Say, I want God to make me all things. I used to go to black churches. Everybody was black. I'm, I, I would say to myself, son of Angelus, there's something wrong here. 
I go to the white church. Everybody was white. I go to the Hispanic church. Ore ese que pasa. They were all Hispanics. I knew that church was screwed up. I'm not insulting your church. Maybe God has called you to an area to do that only. There are exceptions. But I found very, a very small number. You get it? They were controlled by their color. By their race. By their this, by their that. I was just trying to find somebody that was under the control of the Holy Ghost. Because I knew that if I reached that person, that, ch that church would change. And by the way, God was changing me too. You got it? I am made all things to all men. See, that's what we've missed. Are, is, are we saying, God, make me whatever that person needs? Even though it might taint my, represent, my, my reputation. No, but we all want to be the, the David in the story, amen? You'd be surprised what David was. Next verse. And this I do for the gospel. You become all things to all men for the gospel. sake that I might what be a partaker thereof with you you're not a partaker of the gospel unless you're able to become weak or strong or weep with them or laugh with them see it's all about them God is focusing on them. Next verse, 1 Corinthians 10.33, and the verse that follows is 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, because the next chapter starts, but it says, Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, You can't even get people to serve in the church. You think they're, they're going to go out and serve the world? You guys are such an exception, it's not even funny. I don't even know what to do with you guys. But we're moving on to higher ground. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many to get them saved. That they may be saved. Next verse. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That's when Paul said that. Brother, I don't want to drive to the hood in a Ferrari and try to get them to want to be successful like me. All I'm doing, it's putting a seed of greed. And the only reason they're, they're going to make any type of change is because they're going to want a Ferrari.
Nothing wrong with a Ferrari. If you got it legally. I'm serious. I've known people that God has given. I remember me and my wife, this one very wealthy man, got tired of his one luxury car and he, um, he was going to get something else. Uh, the car had, uh, I think it was 37,000 miles. You know, it's like a new car. It was a, a special edition Jaguar 12-cylinder. I mean, and he said, this is for you, not the ministry here. You got it? I didn't con anybody out of it. He gave it to me. God even sent me a Jaguar mechanic. I didn't know how expensive it was to own a car like that. Factory trained mechanic. Popped out of the blues. And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, Preacher, this is your lucky day. And I said, what do you mean? And he says, I'm a factory trained Jaguar mechanic. I'm going to take care of your car for you. And I said, what? Because I had already got the revelation what it would take to own that car. But the children's home got into a situation with finances and me and my wife were sitting there and we're looking at our beautiful car. Boy, I'm telling you something, that 12 cylinders, that baby got it on. Not that I broke the law or anything. And we said, how can we ask how can any be give, anybody give to this ministry? Because the car was a toy. So we sold the car. Every penny went into the ministry. I'm not trying to be pious. We did it for the children. And then that rich man said, uh, he came over and he said, where's your beautiful car? <laughs> we said, well, you know, I didn't want to insult him because he had given it to us. Well, uh, we sold it. He's a businessman. He goes, what you get for it? And you know what the next question is, right? What are you going to do with the money? Well, we already did something with the money. Well, what did you do with it? Because it went all into the children's program. And he looked at me. He gave more to the program. He got more involved in the program than he had ever been, in, been involved before. Because he knew what was important. Are you catching this? Remember, I haven't preached for two and a half weeks. But something's going to be released into you. Get ready. I'm telling you. You're not going to walk out of here the same. Well, what is God going to do? You'll see. It's something only He can do. Philippians 4.11 not that, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, we're in with to be content. Paul said, whether I'm high or low, whether I'm rolling in the dough or not rolling in the dough, I become all things to all men and all that I might win some. Next verse. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound 
everywhere in, in all things. See, he became all things to all men. We're trying to become like this Jesus that is a phony Jesus. The real Jesus went to the gutter, to the hood. And he didn't build a church by having an analysis about how much money is in that neighborhood, the income brackets. And that's where you build the church. I've been around the block. But Jesus would go. That's where he would go. Wherein in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be what? Hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. Listen to this verse, Philippians. 413. I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. Oh, I, maybe we've been misquoting that scripture, huh? That's when that scripture's quoted. I can do anything because I want to be. What they are. I'll weep with them. I'll laugh with them. I almost feel like saying, Will the real Jesus Christ please stand up? Now listen, this is where the Spirit of God is going to hit you like a bomb. Let me tell you what's going to happen to you before it happens to you. What possessed Jesus to did what he did to become like us? Are you ready? Whatever possessed him to do that for the lost. Whatever possessed the Father to send him. Whatever possessed the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the core of God. His essence. What motivated God to bring the power of the cross? To pay the price? To take our place? You talk about becoming like us? He became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of, of God in Christ Jesus. That is what God is bringing to us. The essence of what motivates Him. To save the world. Are you ready? Are you ready? It's going to come out. I'm telling you, it's going to come on you. How do you know that's going to happen? I've been praying to God for it to happen to me first. This story involves a successful man, a hardened man, it's a peril, a little story. A man that, as a child, went through things, but oh, he was successful now. No one could hurt him anymore. The second character in the story is a little boy. who him and his family 
didn't have much. And thirdly, the star of this parable, of this story, a puppy. This very, very wealthy and powerful man happened to be obsessed with a certain particular breed of dog. Me and my wife used to breed dogs. We, we used to have an incredible line. You build your line up. It takes you years. Genetically, you study. You, you breed your animals with other animals. Uh, 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 let me tell you something. Do, our dogs had better paperwork and lineage than me and my wife had ever studied about ourselves. I mean, I'm, I'm t it was ridiculous. You would literally, it was a scroll, you would do this. This wide a lineage is where the dog came from, who their mama, their granddaddy, what they did, how many times they burped. But what happens is when you breed and you're, uh, see, we didn't do this, but when a, a, a puppy comes in and it doesn't meet the standards, you either sell them as family stock, and there's a contract that the people sign when you give it over, or you put it to sleep. A lot of the hardcore breeders, breeders they put the puppies that are not perfect, they, they just, you know, they just kill them. They, they, they get rid of them because they're purifying their own what? Line. See, you're eliminating the bad genes in your line, you know, and so forth. It's all about having that perfect dog so this man a new leader had been born in the middle of the night he had other big businesses but he went there because he wanted to look at this new line they were born in the evening and you know, and so forth. And then some things happened and, and some time went by and he couldn't, he, he couldn't get there for a couple of weeks. But he finally tears himself away from the other business and he's going to go look at this new stock from his two best dogs. You got it? And he walks in there and and before he had a, a chance to really look at the dogs, see, there was a counter. He was behind the counter. And where this new litter was, they were to the left on a plexiglass, you know, that's plastic glass, in, in this kennel deal with a little enclosure, like a little cave, where the mama and all the puppies were but he walks in goes behind the counter and this all of a sudden he's about to go look at his at, at, his, at his new litter and he, and he turns and there's this little head with these little fingers and he said mister he looked at the boy and he saw Dirty little fingers, you know, the hair wasn't properly groomed. And he said, Mister, I want to buy a dog. And he said, You do? He said, Well, how much money have you got? He said, Mister, I have $20. This kid had just walked into a place where you didn't walk in unless you had some serious money. And the man said, $20, huh? And he said, that's right. It's taken me a long time. I went all over my neighborhood and asked people. I've done all kinds of things, but I'm ready to buy my dog. My mom and dad 
said it was okay. All of a sudden, the boy looked to the left where the new litter was. The man looks. All of a sudden, out of the little hut in the kennel comes the mama and all these beautiful little puppies, you know, barely. But all of a sudden, The last puppy had the form hips. And all the other puppies moved on, but this other one, he, he could use his front. He looked like. And the little boy looked at the man and he said, I want him! I'll do anything for him! I'll come and clean the kennels! I'll polish his shoes! I love him! I must have that Dog! And this cold hardened man said, Why would you want that? He's worthless. He needs to be put to sleep. He's deformed. He'll never run with you. He'll never chase a ball. Why would you want that? Remember, the little boy was behind the counter. The little boy stood back. It was winter. And he opened up his coat. And he had metal braces down both of his legs. And he said, you ask me why? He looked at that man and said, because he's just like me. I'll do anything for him. I know him. The power of God hit that cold-hearted man. And he started to weep. He went over and he got the crippled little dog. And he went over and he kneeled down in front of the little boy. And he hugged him and he said, He's just like us. And that man was saved. They're just like us. That's what's wrong. We have become a superior species. But the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, God sent his son. What was put inside of that little boy, what struck that cold-hearted man, is the very essence of what motivates God to do the the things he does, is to get them saved. And God is going to give us, I'm warning you, God is going to give us that. We're going to have such power to get people saved that it's going to be mind-boggling. Because that very essence, Jesus became like us. (laughs) 
but we're going to reach them with the love of God and a compassion. Do you get it? That's the beginning. That's what's going to happen right here in this church. And we're going to see signs and wonders. You should have been there when that guy fell and he raised his hands and God had completely healed him. He got up and oh my goodness, he talked different. If you're watching over the internet, Jesus knows what it is to suffer. He knows what it is to be the rejected one. Jesus also knows how to be the richest. It doesn't matter where you're at. You can be rich and be broken inside. And I want to encourage all of you right now. Do we want this? Do we want the very essence that motivates God to do what he does and to be who he is? Do we have enough tenacity? Do we have enough courage right now to look at God right at his face and say, God, whatever you want in this me, in this church, in my family and whatever. This is not a wimpy prayer. This is a prayer for those that are so weak that they completely turn to God in every area. I'll do anything for that puppy. You don't understand, mister, what's motivating me to do this. He's just like me. Are we ready? Do you know how long God has been waiting to hear this prayer? Together, a whole church praying the same thing in one mind and one accord. What do you think they prayed on the day of Pentecost? Oh, Lord, I hope we all become compatible. We're all going to have a, a, a meeting, you know, and, and we're just going to try to work things out. Are you kidding me? They said, whatever you want. That was the one mind and one accord. Whatever you want, take all of us. Turn us inside out, right side up. We don't care what you do, God, as long as it's you. Scriptures that followed that. It was a council meeting in a town, in a city. You know what the conclusion of the meeting was? It was an emergency meeting that was called. They said, that's what they said, Kenny. They said, it was an emergency meeting. It was a crisis. They said, those that have turned the whole world upside down have come to this city. What? You've heard about them. You've heard stories about those people. But I've, we've called this emergency meeting to let all the holy leaders know that they bridged our defenses. They're here. Those that raise the dead, heal the sick, save the... Yes, cast out devils. Are here. And what's inside of us is in trouble. So are we ready to pray this prayer? We're going to put such a smile on God's face.
cookie. You are dangerous. I've always... No Watch out when somebody has a nickname like Cookie. Oh, that's your real name? Nickname, yeah. Watch out. Well, who's the guy that you're going to fight in that warehouse? Oh, his name is Sweetie Pie. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to double up on my training. <laughs> Sweetie Pie means he's a monster. He'll bite your head off. <laughs> have you made up your mind? We're going to do this. Get ready. The love of God is going to protect you first from yourself. That's what we're doing right now. But then that which protects you from yourself will destroy everything else that will ever come against you. We're not going to close our eyes. We're going to look up to heaven. I look up to heaven. What do I see? Troy. <laughs> <laughs> His wife said, well, I won't cause any problems. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, this is what you want. This is what you'll get today. We all pray this. We enter into covenant with you. The covenant that is the most powerful covenant of them all. Not my will, but thy will be done in my life, in my everything. There it is, Lord. I bring my body, my everything, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Sir, you will never be the same. There's been this pulling from God. And I'm not talking about, you know, you being you know, uh, Dracula or the werewolf or something. And, but there's been this pull from God. And sometimes we don't know how to be swallowed up by God. But God said, I've stored your lunch today. And I've blessed it. And I'm giving it back to you. 
And you're going to know my everlasting mercy and my compassion like never before. You're going to have encounters with my presence that you've only dreamed of. And that in turn is going to cause you to become what he wants on this earth out of a man. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, just do it right now. Just say here. If you've been away from Jesus, say here. Jesus, I just want to make sure, Jesus, that I know that, yeah, I have given everything to you. I just want to reestablish it. I want to reconfirm it right now. Okay. We're finished. Take what the Holy Spirit has given you today and ponder and say, God, I'm pressing into it. I'm not going to lose this. I'm not going to lose this. It's not your will. But I'm growing in it. Next week, we're going to find out about the fellowship of his suffering. It's so different than what we thought it is. Now, please stand. We're going to throw our smooch up to God. Don't ever forget, Mr. He's just like me. Let's throw our smooch up to him. And, you know, you put a smile on his face. You're going to leave this place knowing that you bless God. I am blessed, Almighty God. God bless you guys. Hallelujah.